Thanks, Sherry and NWAC and all the folks. And for all of you for being here on a beautiful, sunny uh, Seattle Sunday um, and taking your Sunday to be here. The last two talks were really great. Um, told me that humans are really complex, so we're going we're gonna to shift gears and bring it down a level, talk a little bit about avalanches and tree rings. And I'm going to talk about how we use tree rings to help understand avalanche frequency. I changed the title of my talk because my 10-year-old told me to. Um, <laughs> and really, chainsaws are fun, and I'll show you why. First, I'd like to acknowledge all of my collaborators and co-authors. Um, think of all these folks. Yordi is here. He's the one with the funny accent that's been asking questions so far. Um, but thanks to all of them, without this, we obviously wouldn't be able to pull this off. So chainsaws and tree rings. Two of the questions that we're trying to answer is, what is the frequency of large magnitude avalanches on a regional scale? And I'll sort of explain what regional means and how we are trying to come up with what region actually means. And then what climate variables or atmospheric, uh, so, uh, atmospheric variables contribute to large magnitude avalanche years? So dendrochronology, it's the study of tree rings, and we're using it to study avalanche frequency over time. People have used tree rings to study all sorts of stuff, from landslides, uh, climate, you can look at the ring widths of tree rings to look at big snow years, low snow years, big precip years, that sort of thing, temperature. Um, trees can actually tell us a lot about what's going on in the natural environment. So dendrochronology has been used to study avalanches for quite some time now. Um, it's actually a pretty popular uh, tool that has been used all around the world uh, to look back in time. So our observational records are great. Dallas talked about submitting your observations and all sorts of avalanche observation, um, operations have kept long records of avalanche observations over time, but they only go back so far. So we can use tree rings to basically send us further back in time, and we use it as a proxy or a substitute for looking at avalanches um, way back in history when we just didn't have an observational record. So oh, let me go back real quick. So when we talk about large magnitude avalanches, we're talking about size uh, D3 or larger. And so, you know, pretty big slides um, for those that are familiar with the, uh, the destructive scale. So the work I'm going to talk about today is mostly focused in northwest Montana. How many folks have been to and around Glacier National Park? All right, you're the ones that are contributing to all of the uh, visitors in the summertime and taking up all of my bandwidth, thanks. Um, so. Oh, that's funny. The numbers got squished. Anyways, um, not really sure what happened there, but this is the map of northwest Montana. We sampled four mountain ranges in, um, in the area. So in the upper right, the uppermost uh, upper right quadrant there is Glacier National Park. And we sampled two areas in the park, one in the central part of the park and one along the southern border along Highway 2. And those two areas, the, the one area is along the going to the Sun Road, and many of you have probably driven that road before. And so we sampled along that and Highway 2 that are transportation corridors. So infrastructure, highways, there's also a railway along the Highway 2 corridor as well that eventually makes its way all the way over to here. And then we sampled two areas. The upper left is the Swan Range, or the Whitefish Range, and then the Swan Range in the lower left where we looked at two really popular recreation areas that don't have infrastructure. So here's an example, again, those of you might be familiar with the going to the Sun Road, and then this is John F. Stevens Canyon um, along Highway 2 over Marias Pass. And again, there's a railway, you can kind of see, let me see if this thing works, yeah, there's the railway right there, you can see some of the sheds right here as well. So decent sized avalanche paths that affect the transportation corridor in both places. So we took, or in these areas, what we did is we took mostly dead and down trees, and we took cross sections from these trees. And I'll talk about why we're using cross sections as opposed to just cores, because you may have heard of dendrochronology before, where folks have you know, cored into the tree with the tree borer and pulled out a little section of it. And we'll talk about why cross sections are a more robust way of looking at this problem. So we have take these dead and down trees. Here's an example. You can see the little red circle there with an arrow and that indicates the uphill side of the tree. And that's, from the outside when you're looking at a tree, that's a typical scar. Um, it's a good scar. Those are the sorts of samples that we're looking for. And you can see right here, it's kind of a, 
a cat's face right here, um, but this is the scar on the tree that has been impacted by avalanches at least one year, but probably several years. So here's a little example um, of what we're This doing. right here we suspect could be an avalanche scar, but what we'd do is then we'd cut into this dead and down tree and then take a thin cross section from this tree and then we can take that to the lab, process it by sanding it, looking at it under the microscope, counting all the rings, and then cross dating it. Ah, chainsaws. So when we take them back to the lab, we have to sand them and process them, make them, the surfaces really smooth so that we can actually look at them under the microscope and find these signals that we're talking about. So here's an example. And as avalanche professionals, we like to categorize things into five discrete bins, so we decided we were going to do that when we classified these signals. Um, so the 1972 impact scar is a class one, so we, we changed things up a little bit. Um, as a class one scar, that's a really good scar. That's the sort of signal that we would love to find in all of our trees. Um, unfortunately, we don't, so we have to sort of downgrade um, some of these other signals as well. So in 1950, you can see a really small scar right here, but then we have something called reaction wood. So the again, 1972 would be our high quality class one scar. 1950 would be, there's a little bit of a scar, but you know, that could even be a moose walking along and kind of scratching against the tree for a while, <laughs> bending the tree over and then moving along. So maybe it was a moose, maybe it was something else, um, maybe it was an avalanche. So then we associate or we connect it with reaction wood. And reaction wood is, imagine if you have your tree and you have your avalanche coming down, hitting your tree, and it doesn't break, it doesn't get destroyed, but maybe it just, it's a glancing blow, but enough to sort of tilt it. Well, what the tree is gonna do is put on wood on the downhill side to sort of buffer that impact. And so we call that reaction wood. On the uphill side is the compression wood. And so when we have those two together, that would be sort of a class two, three, um, and then four and five is maybe just reaction wood. We're not really sure. Maybe the tree just bent over and is for whatever reason. Um, so we definitely classify these things and that helps in our uh, subsequent analysis. So we had 647 samples and 509 of those were class one and two. Here's another example of 1959 reaction wood you can see up there in the top part of the, of the uh, slide. And then down here from 2003 is a really good impact scar um, that was, uh, sorry, when the avalanche hit the tree, you can see from 2003, but then in 1959, an earlier avalanche, so we had reaction wood being put on on the downhill side. So earlier I talked about using cross sections versus co just cores, so just coring into the tree. So these lines on here sort of indicate a five millimeter core, that's the, si the size of the uh, tool that you'd put into the tree and turn it. Um, you can do these to live trees, which is, is, the, is a nice thing, um, that it doesn't really impact the tree. And so, but the problem is, is that when you put this tool into the tree, you might even miss the center, but imagine if you went in all four directions, because we try and sample in, you know, in uh, 90 degrees to each other. It doesn't go through the whole tree, but we try to get to the center. And you can see that we might have missed a scar from 1933. So it doesn't necessarily give us the whole picture if we just take these cores. So for ours, uh, for this study, we tried to grab as many cross sections as we possibly could, over 600. So I do have a few figures, but this is a, seems like a really well-educated crowd. Um, so I'm pretty sure you'll get most of them. The number of growth disturbances. So that's basically the signals, the number of signals that we found in all of our trees. So some trees will harbor zero signals and some trees will have a lot. Uh, it really depends. Depends on where they are in the avalanche path, depends on how old the tree is, etc. So the nice thing is, is that, again, most of our signals are high quality, as I mentioned before, but we have over 2,000 growth disturbances in our data set. So that's one of the larger data sets out there. So here, if we're looking at the age of the tree, you can see that our mean age is about 70, or is 73 years. And we had trees that extended, the age of the tree extended as far back to 1636. Um, so we had some pretty old trees, which is nice. It might potentially give us a long chronology. Well, let's see. So if we look here, we can see that these are the samples by year. Again, we're looking at avalanche signals now, not just the tree. And the total number of responses of growth disturbances, again, is just over 2,300, and they extend back into, the avalanche signal at least, extends back into uh, the mid-1650s. Now you'll notice 
of course, that there are quite a few here and then there's some big gaps. And as we get closer to current time, we have quite a few more samples. That's the problem with using tree rings to look at avalanches is the avalanche likes to take out the tree. So we're losing data by studying the phenomenon um, that we want to study. So that's a problem. But there are ways to get around that. One is we look at just the percentage of trees um, that are scarred from that year. So when we go back to those samples that are really, really old, we might have one or two samples from, let's say, 1650, but 100% 100 of the samples are scarred. So that's, that's, again, it's nice that we have samples that go back that far, but the problem is, is that, again, is it an avalanche if we only have one sample, or is it that pesky moose that survived since 1650? We don't know. Um, so one scarred tree does not an avalanche make. So what we have to do is we have to try and try and get through the signal versus the noise. So are we really seeing an avalanche signal or is it just something else? And one way is we do a threshold per path. So what we do is we take what's called an avalanche activity index for that path. And we look at the number, the percentage of samples that exhibit an avalanche signal or a scar, you know, one of those signals. And we take that in any given year, divide it by the trees alive in that year. And then we take the percentage of responses determined by, we, we fit a distribution to it, an extreme value distribution, because what we're looking at are sort of these extreme events, these big events. And that gives us a threshold, so it basically reduces the noise in all of these samples. And then another way is those high quality measurements, those class one and two, we weight those more heavily than we do those other samples. So by doing these and by basically putting them through this sort of complex uh, threshold analysis, we came up with 22 avalanche years that uh, basically from the 1650s up until now. It doesn't seem like, lot, like very many years, but again, consider that we're talking about large magnitude avalanche cycles. And the one thing we want to consider too is that this is a minimum number of years. Again, because of the problem that avalanches will destroy the thing that we're looking at to tell us if there are avalanches. So we have to consider this sort of a minimum number of avalanche years. So some of you who understand math may know the, or may recognize the equation notation in the upper left, but what this really means is we're talking about the sum of that avalanche activity index that I talked about earlier and dividing it by the number of paths that could potentially record an avalanche in that year. So that gives us it's sort of a way of standardizing or normalizing the years even as we go far back in time. What that allows us to do is come up with a regional avalanche activity index. So what you see here is for the entire region. It's all 12 of our avalanche paths in all four of those mountain ranges. And you can see that we have some big years, 1933, 1950, in the 19... Uh, 70s, 1972 and 80, and then in 2003, and then of course more recently in 2017. 2017 is really high because we observed it. We knew it was happening. So a lot of the trees that we sampled in 2017 that summer had been destroyed by an avalanche. So it's excessively high. But I wanted to include it to give that perspective of you know when we look at an observational record versus just the tree ring record. So when we look at this, one of the things we're, we're looking at now and applying a variety of techniques to is are we seeing more avalanches through time or not? Or are we seeing fewer avalanches? And that's the, that's the big question, right? Are we going to see more avalanches or not? So again, a few figures, but I know you guys can handle it. We grouped it by the region, by the, uh, the mountain range. And so the gray and the blue are in Glacier National Park. The green are in the Swan Range. And the red or orange are in the Whitefish Range. So what these are, again, those are the avalanche paths. We're looking at our return intervals here on the y-axis. And the dark black lines basically mean the center value for these return intervals. So we're looking at, again, over time, these return intervals. And you can see that within each mountain range, at least in the park, in the gray area in Southern Glacier Park, you know, they're around this, they're, they're close enough. Um, in the central part of the park, that mean return interval is pretty close, but there's a lot of variability in one of those paths. That path over there was located on the east side of the Continental Divide, and it was a really big path. And one of the reasons it's, there's so much variability is because they had a return interval of, um, it's, not on, it's actually a bit of an outlier, but it was 80 years. So it's quite a bit of variability there, as well as the ones in the Swan Range. Now when we combine those, and we do our threshold and all of our analyses again, you can see that 
in the mountain ranges themselves, so that was per path, but in the mountain ranges themselves, we actually have a, the return intervals are a bit closer together. And so that when we look at the region overall, the blue box over there, we have a return interval of large magnitude cycle roughly every seven years. So those notable avalanche years, they all have above average snow water equivalent. They all have below average temperatures. And when we compare them to the historical record, which we did to kind of look at how, they, how well they compared to our limited historical record, it gets a little variable and a little tricky. So our historical record, our longest record at least in that area, comes from the Highway 2 corridor in John F. Stevens Canyon, and it comes from highway workers, railway workers, and they did an incredibly detailed job of documenting avalanches, and this is some of the work that they came up with. So trouble, trouble. These are the only words to describe the Middle Fork country this past week. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, you know, that wasn't their job. They're not avalanche forecasters. Um, but that was what we had to work with. So we could, you know, it, it was a bit tricky to come up with a comparison between the historical record and the tree ring record. So 10 of our 14 years, this one only goes back to 1920 because we're looking at snow records from the area snow tell sites and we're looking at uh, snow courses, so that's why they go back to the 1920s. We can see that 10 of our 14 years had above average snow water equivalent. And on the bottom here is we're looking at non-avalanche years versus avalanche years, and again, just another way of representing that avalanche years basically are big snow years. No surprise so far. So then we went through a few statistical techniques, and in a for those of you that are familiar, pr uh, principal component analysis, we looked at a variety of atmospheric and climate variables. So we're talking about things like snow water equivalent, snow depth. We're looking at things like everybody's favorite El Nino or La Nina. Um, we're looking at the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a longer term scale but similar to El Nino and looking at sea surface temperatures across the Pacific. And what we came up with is that PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and snow water equivalent explain over 40% of the variability with, the, with these large magnitude avalanche years. Component two is the Arctic Oscillation. So the Arctic Oscillation, I'll explain in just a little bit here. But the take home point from this so far is that over half of our variability can be explained by atmosphere, atmospheric circulations and snow depth. So in Northwest Montana, we have a negative PDO and a negative El Nino are basically our snowiest years. Those are the fun years. And those are when we typically have low pressure parked right over the Northwest. And you guys are probably familiar with that as well. It's a very similar um, and fun winter when that happens. And you can see over on the right this little chart or this little figure that shows the difference from average seasonal snowfall is that in the Northwest in particular, we have an abundance of snow during those years. So the Arctic Oscillation, the media loves the, the term polar vortex. They, 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 they anthropomorphize the polar vortex. They're like the most vicious polar vortex ever. Um, it's kind of associated with the Arctic Oscillation. So in Northwest Montana, the way that manifests is that we get cold air coming in from Canada, and it spills over the divide. It has to go through customs first. Then it comes over the divide, and it spills over. Sometimes it takes longer than, than other times, and eventually it makes its way over. When that cold air interacts with moist air coming in from the southwest, those are the biggest storms and subsequently the biggest avalanche cycles that we get in northwest Montana. So when we have a positive Arctic oscillation, cold air typically stays confined to you know, the Arctic... Uh, the Arctic area, or at least about 55 degrees north and, and north. When it's negative, it tends to spill over more, so we tend to get a little bit more colder air. Now, where we are, and where we are here in the northwest, you know, we're right along that line where maybe it's a negative Arctic oscillation, or maybe it's positive, but we st we'll still get cold air. But so far, what our results have shown is that when we do have a, uh, a negative um, Arctic oscillation, we tend to get more uh, large magnitude avalanche cycles. So the other thing we can do is not only associate climate and atmospheric variables, but we can look at how these avalanches move across um, space. So we can take all of our little trees, some are big, but all of our tree samples across our avalanche paths, and we can apply a variety of geostatistical techniques, and in every single path we can basically come up with a map that shows the return period, especially across this avalanche path. So you can see here, these are just basically four different ways 
of coming up with it. The one in the bottom right is an ensemble, so it's sort of a combination of all three. But if we look down here, a return period in years is uh, bigger year, bigger return periods are in, in orange. And you can see on this side, it's quite orange. So what often happens is when avalanches, the, you can't quite see it here on the map, but the, the middle or the channel of this avalanche path forces avalanches to the skier's right side of this path. So we're getting more frequent return periods. So the usefulness of this, of course, is for infrastructure planning. And as you can see here, there, maybe you can or can't from where you're sitting, but there's an avalanche or there's a, a snow shed right here uh, along the railway. So th these sorts of maps really help for not only the avalanche forecasters for those different operations, but for infrastructure planning as well. So here's a closer up view. You can see the, the shed right here, and this is the Highway 2 corridor right here. And again, more frequent avalanches on this side of the avalanche path. So to conclude, the things we found so far is our return interval has about seven years for our entire region. So roughly, you know, every seven years, we can expect a large magnitude avalanche. And so far, our results suggest that we're seeing an increase, a small increase in the regional avalanche activity through time. But the problem becomes is when we, we actually segment our time series. So we're still working on that. For atmospheric connections, our large magnitude avalanches are associated or characterized by above average snow years and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation as well as the Arctic Oscillation and even some influence from our favorite El Nino um, comes into play. But the problem here is caution inferring these climate signals from these records because as we all know, avalanches heavily depend on weather, but climate being sort of the overall driver of weather, um, there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a step there that we need to make, but we need to be careful in making that step. So there is just a bit of caution there. And then our next steps are using reconstructed SWE. So as I mentioned earlier, people, can, people have used tree rings to look and reconstruct snow depth and snow water equivalent back in time. So we're actually gonna take those records and try and use those to compare our oldest avalanche records where we don't have an observed snow water equivalent or snow depth from any stations or snow courses. And then we're also doing some of this avalanche chronology work in southeast Alaska and uh, in Colorado after they had their, that large magnitude avalanche cycle last March. Um, we've gone out with, uh, and they're already sampling now, and the goal is to sort of look at um, not only on a regional or state scale there uh, in Colorado, but also um, compare sort of the southern or central Rockies in Colorado to the northern Rockies here in Montana. So with that, thanks again for coming. And any questions? I think we have a minute. Thank you. Um, are there any questions before we head out to lunch? Oh, we got one. One second. Ah, oh, there's no such thing as silly questions. <laughs> no, no silly questions, except I'm, I'm standing between you and lunch. I apologize. <laughs> How do you get the exact date by year that the tree died? Was it you just see the avalanche kill the tree? That's a great question. So um, that's one of the most important pieces of, of the processing that we go through, um, but I didn't mention because um, we only have a few minutes. But basically what we do is we, we take um, samples from outside of an avalanche path. So it doesn't have to be right outside, but somewhere within the region. And then we compare the ring widths of the samples that are outside the avalanche path. So we'll take cores for that. We compare the ring widths of that versus the ring widths of our own samples that we collected in the avalanche path. And then basically through regression, we look at do, how well do those ring widths compare to each other. And so that whole process is called cross-dating. So we're basically, because we don't know, you're right, we don't know when they were killed or when the scars were. So that's how we compare it to, because um, we know that this tree outside of the avalanche path, as we're coring into it, the outside ring is going to be that year. And so that allows us to sort of um, cross-date with pretty high confidence. Um, there is a question in the center. If we could get a mic there. He basically stole my question. Oh, Damn okay. It. And then we have an, okay, another one, another question. Hey, I'm not sure if this is super related, but do you have any thoughts on logging and clear cutting and how that affects avalanche terrain? Sorry, was it logging? Is that what you said? Logging and clear cutting. Well, um, 
basically, I mean, if you're, if you're clearing in a slope, whether, regardless of the process, whether it's logging or if it's an avalanche itself or fire, um, the dynamics are going to be way different. So snowfall, as the snow falls and accumulates on that slope, it's going to be much different than if it is in the trees. So you're going to have different behavior. So, and if it's steep enough, then we may see more avalanches um, in that area. I, I guess one, one little example is um, this past spring in Sun Valley, Idaho, it was in the media again, um, where there was a, where avalanches came down and they basically destroyed a couple of houses in uh, Warm Springs area outside of Ketchum, for those that are familiar. And uh, the avalanche occurred in an area that was previously burned. And records prior to the burn, I mean, it was a really thick forest, so you would not want to ski there. Um, but now people are actually skiing there because it's open and it's good skiing, good terrain. Um, but it's also now avalanche terrain because you have fewer anchors and you, know, you, you don't have trees intercepting the snowfall, so your snowpack is going to look different. Um, so I suspect that, I haven't looked at it, but I suspect that logging would probably do very similar things in terms of changing the, the snowpack when it's accumulating on the ground. Great. I think we have time for one more question, unless uh, we got one in the back here. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I was just wondering if uh, the places that you took your samples from were in avalanche paths that receive any form of like avalanche mitigation or were they all in areas of natural cycles? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so most of them were, I would say, almost all of them were um, natural avalanche cycles, except they're occas they'll occasionally do avalanche mitigation uh, along the Highway 2 corridor, but only in emergency cases, because the avalanche, uh, avalanche paths originate, the starting zones originate in the national park. So Burlington Northern Santa Fe has a permit to do emergency avalanche mitigation, but they don't conduct it on a regular basis. But that's the only area where any avalanche control work was done. But the cycles, at least the big years that we found in that area, um, were natural cycles. Um, 2003 in particular was a big year sort of throughout the whole region. But yeah, that's a great question. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. That was super Thanks informative. So